Welcome all, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, my name is Matt Holdstock. I'm one of the AWRI's senior knowledgeists, and I'll be your webinar host for today. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. In today's session, we're going to have a look at the overview of the global wine landscape with a webinar titled Global Wine Market Trends. But before we jump in and make a start, just a couple of quick reminders to anyone who is new to the Adabri webinar program. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send to send it through. We will hold the Q&A session at the end of this presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any stage throughout the presentation. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and you will be emailed a link to view the recording of the Adabrise uh, on the Adabrise YouTube channel. For anyone who has joined today, uh, who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is global wine market trends and it's great pleasure to welcome Simone George from Seattle, Australia. Simone has 16 years of experience in her role as global wine and grape broker with Seati, and this sees her covering the domestic, European and Asian business for the Australian arm of the Seati company. Simone has a Bachelor of Wine Marketing from the University of Adelaide and is very well placed to run us through this webinar today. So welcome, Simone. Simone, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Beautiful. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Matt. So today I'll be taking your listeners through some information on the wine production levels around the world. Um, we'll go into detail on the Australian bulk wine market, uh, and then we'll go through the rest of the markets uh, around the globe before we'll finish up with some pricing tables just for some comparison. Simone, can I just get you to share your screen there? Oh, geez. There we go. Is that that's looking good? Uh, just just uh, wait a couple of seconds, we'll get the internet to... All good, over okay. to you. Beautiful. So for those of you who don't know too much about Seati, uh, we are the world's largest grape and wine broker. We have been around for quite some time. Um, we were formed back in 1971 and we've got a, a few offices on the ground, so plenty of people uh, on the ground for us to give us those real-time uh, uh, conversations to let us know where pricing is at and um, all the other bits and pieces that we need to make our systems work. Uh, our head office is based in uh, Nevada, uh, which is just north of San Francisco in California. And we don't only deal with bulk wine, but we also dabble with uh, grapes, concentrate, juices, alcohols, and we also do a lot of uh, evaluation services if you've got the bank looking for pricing of what your bulk wine is currently worth at the moment. So taking you through some of the global wine production numbers, you can see the table on the left-hand side there, which shows the last couple of years uh, in millions of hectolitres. Um, the last couple of years have been pretty consistent all around that 260 million hectolitre mark. Um, that's a pretty average year for what we've seen. Um, the Northern Hemisphere was down last year, but the Southern Hemisphere was up. If you look on the right-hand side there, you can see the breakdown of it country by country. Um, you can see Italy there at the top, nearly making up one fifth of the world's production. Uh, France and Spain, not too far behind. They're always jostling for those sort of top three positions. Uh, if you look down at number five, you can see Australia there at 5.4%. So we're, you know, we're not huge in the scheme of things, but we definitely have a, a fair bit of material to move. And we tend to jostle between you know, Chile and Argentina with our sizing as well. So global wine production for the Southern Hemisphere, um, we recorded our highest wine production ever in 2021 with 59 million hectolitres. Uh, that worked out to be about a 23% representation of the global wine production. It was a bump up from um, the year prior by 19%. 
So it definitely was uh, uh, making a fair bit of booze available for the rest of the, the globe out there. Um, we know Europe was down in 2021, uh, France in particular, because of so much frost and a few other issues with the weather conditions. Uh, and as a whole over Europe, you know, they saw an 8% reduction from, from where they were. Like I mentioned before, Italy, France and Spain, they're pretty big players. So they make up nearly 40% or 47% of the world's wine production. So they take out a, a fair bit of that volume there for the, uh, the northern side. Just to give you a bit more of a breakdown there, um, you can see the full listing of the countries here. The countries in grey are all European, the, the ones in green are outside of that scope. Um, France and Spain obviously took quite a hit. You can see they're down minus 19%, minus 14% year on year compared to 2020. And then you can see on the right hand side that the variance between uh, last year and the five year average as well. Um, if you look further down, you can see Australia and Chile, they definitely came up with their numbers, both up 30% and both up on that sort of five year uh, longer term average. Argentina wasn't far behind either, up 16%. And if you look a little further down, we do have China listed in there, but their figures don't always correlate as a lot of their vineyards are more for table grapes than they are for wine grapes. So we don't always get them uh, relating perfectly to what we want. And lastly, on the bottom there, you can see New Zealand. Um, they took quite a hit last year. They had a pretty small size crush, so they were down 19% as well. So moving straight into Australia, look, we all know there's a lot of red wine out there. We've got a very large red wine inventory. Uh, it's across all price points, across all regions, uh, across all qualities. The only sort of exception to that rule is Pinot Noir, which is quite high in demand and, and very hard to source. Um, whites on the other side are very good, um, seeing a lot of demand for Savvy Blanc, Pinot Gris, bits and pieces for Chardonnay uh, and Prosecco. So that sort of material and pricing is staying quite, quite steady. Um, I guess on the red sides, you know, we did have a very big crush in 2021. The demand hasn't been high simply because everyone has material available. They're not out chasing it down. They don't need to buy it when they've got it in the tank. Um, and also with shipping, international shipping being quite challenging, um, we just can't get that material offshore and out to the other countries where we need it. So we've got some good demand there coming out of Europe and North America, but just getting it on a, a vessel and out of the country has just been a little bit more difficult. Um, the cost of international freight is also difficult. You know, 12 months ago, you could have got a container over to Europe out of Australia for around 26 cents a litre. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's nearly double that. We're sort of looking at 48 to 50 cents a litre just to get your freight over there. Um, and the issue is that a lot of the the buyers from Europe who are looking at those prices, they've locked in contracts with supermarkets for 12 months at lower prices. And now they need to cover for that cost of the, the additional freight. So it makes it uh, very difficult for them to accommodate that. Um, moving through, we know the 22 crush number came out just a couple of weeks ago, 1.73 million tonnes. It's 2% down on a long-term crush. 13.5% down on last year's uh, 2 million tonne crush. It's still probably far too large in size because we have so much carryover stock still sitting around in tank. Uh, we estimate about 500 million litres of material out there, if not a little bit more. Um, and I guess we put that into uh, account by saying if you needed around about 1.5 million tonnes for Australia's needs for domestic and export, if we were 500 over in 2021 and we were 230 over in 2022, add them together, times them by 720, there's well over 500 million litres, not to mention the, the stock left over from 2020 and 2019 as well. So we do have some really competitively priced bulk. We're probably the cheapest red supplier out there at the moment. Um, but even saying that, we're just, we're just still having a, a lot of difficulty getting that material to move to offshore and, and turning it into sales at this point in time. So next year, we do expect that great prices will soften. Um, there will be, I think, a reasonable amount of red wine or red vines uh, material left on the vine. Um, we just don't have the space to put it into tank. Uh, the wineries are not moving it through to get it to sale at this point in time. So it's going to be 
uh, coming down to a point there where we either look at mothballing some of the red vineyards, um, a vine pool or a government subsidy might be something we're going to need to look at in the future. I don't know that there's any cash flow in it from the Albanese government at this point in time, but I think, I think it's something we definitely need to at least push for to see if we can get some conversations happening around it. Will China ever come back? I think they will one day, but I don't think that that's going to be any time soon. There's been a lot of talk about it lately and with coal coming back online, but it does seem to be a bit of a, a touch and go scenario at this moment. So I think a lot of people aren't willing to just hold out and hope for you know, good news from them anytime soon. If you look over on the left hand side of the screen, I've got a couple of tables there just to show you the total export value and volume of all wine leaving Australia. So you can see that we were doing quite well there up until you know the time frame of when those Chinese tariffs came into effect in late 2020. Um, you look down the bottom there, you can see the China table where they were making up well over one third of our value of exports going out. Uh, and you know, sort of 17, 18% of the volume that we're shipping out of the country. Obviously, that sort of fell off a cliff um, once it all came into effect, you know, in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, good to see that we're going to have some new markets out of India. You know, it's going to take time. It's, it's very much a, a small market, but it's opening up the door. Um, it's not something that's going to replace any China anytime soon, but at least it's something that will keep us going for, for the meantime. Um, I suppose what we're seeing now is, you know, back to pre-China days when we had a lot of buyers uh, or a lot of sellers fighting over European and North American buyers. So it's kind of back to that position again. Uh, we saw it at ProWine earlier in the year where everyone's just looking to get the deal locked in, signed, get the wine out of the tank and get some cash flow. And even if that means, you know, dropping pricing lower and lower than where we really want it to be. Um, just having a quick look at China, even though we know they're not really on our radar at the moment, um, their wine imports for the first five months of the year have declined between sort of 13 and 15 percent. Um, most of what they bring in is bottled, two thirds bottled, one third bulk. Um, we know these figures have gone down simply because of their recent lockdown that they had earlier this year. So they're social creatures. Um, they don't tend to drink at home in front of the TV watching neighbours like we do. It's more out and about whining and dining. So now that those restaurants are finally open up again uh, and we're seeing a bit more traction, we're hoping to see uh, more material moving over that way, notably though from Chile and from France. Um, you would have heard lots of stories about 700 vessels waiting to be unloaded near the port of Shanghai. You know, that's obviously going to take quite some time to clear that backlog. Uh, it's not just the international shipping side of it as well, it's also the domestic freight because when they were in lockdown, um, they had highway closures, they had truck drivers getting PCR tests and then interim quarantine for them while they were waiting for that to get cleared. So it was definitely a, a lengthy time frame to get all this through and it's definitely caused more of a, a bottleneck for them. You've probably also heard about a lot of um, empty shipping containers returning back to Asia, um, not going back over full. Um, it seems to be more viable for them to get them back as quick as they can and get them filled up for shipments heading back out to the US and to Europe. France still remains the uh, biggest bottled wine supplier to China and Chile is still the biggest bulk supplier to China. Um, we definitely saw once they turned off the taps for Australia how they moved their sites over quickly to Chile more so than they have been. Um, in 2021, they bumped up their bulk purchases from them from 40 million up to 58 million litres. So they definitely turned their sites that way. Moving over to New Zealand, uh, they've had a really good bumper crush this year, uh, 532,000 tonnes. So it's up 44% from where they were last year. Last year was a pretty small size crush for them. So they're pretty happy to have some extra stock back in tanks. Demand still remains very high for Senior Blanc. Um, Pricing is probably at the lowest at $5.50 a litre and usually sort of sits in that range between there and $6. Um, a lot of people trying to, trying to do um, pre-harvest contracts, um, domestic and international buyers. Uh, it's still been really hard to source big volumes of bulk. And I think it's simply a reflection that uh, the wineries are putting all their material into bottle goods, which is then going to the US and to the UK. Uh, shipping constraints, uh, you know, uh, 
remains to be uh, an ongoing theme and you're going to see that repeatedly across uh, all my slides going ahead. Um, the other thing to note for New Zealand is that when they did have a short year last year, a lot of buyers uh, turned to Chile and South Africa to source their Sauvignon Blanc elsewhere. Uh, they were able to get it from those countries between US 70 cents and a dollar per litre. So it was far cheaper. So we wonder how many of those people will go back if they get the opportunity to, uh, to be able to take New Zealand material once again. Over to the US, uh, you know, it's always a difficult market here. I think a lot of people were hoping to pick up more business from the US when China uh, turned off the taps. Um, at this point in time, their bulk market is relatively quiet. Um, they've got a fair bit of Cabernet in surplus. And I'll show you a bit more on my next slide. Um, but basically, they had uh, a lot of material on hand during the COVID period when everyone was in lockdown, everyone was home, everyone was drinking. They all went back to work and those sales have really slowed down quite a bit. So now those Cabernet parcels are sitting in tank. They're not necessarily moving anywhere. So they've got a lot of availability that they're still yet to move through. You know, Green Zinfandel, they're quite high in demand. Um, Chardonnay is in a little bit of limbo at the moment, just because a lot of people are waiting to assess the crop size from 2022. Um, it'll probably be a little bit smaller than the average, just because they've had uh, issues with um, limited water, um, limited snowpack, water restrictions, and a little bit of frost earlier this year as well. So th those water restrictions and, and you know drought issues are an ongoing thing for the US. It's um, quite uh, an issue for them going ahead. Um, freight logistic issues on the West Coast are ongoing. It does seem to be getting through a little bit quicker nowadays, but they still have issues with domestic freight, just getting things out of the port and over to warehouses. Um, Sauvignon Blanc has been heavily planted in the valley. Um, whether this will have a long-term effect on New Zealand, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but it looks like, you know, if they've got enough of it, then they may cut back some of the material that they purchase elsewhere. And the inflation rate. Again, this is going to be an ongoing theme that you'll see throughout the rest of my slides, but 9.1, it's a 40 year high. So a lot of people are, are definitely watching their pennies, um, just reducing how much they spend because they are very mindful of what's going on in the marketplace. This slide just shows you the bulk availability that we have in the US at the moment. Um, if you look over on the left hand side, we've got July 2021, you can see the tall blue stick. Uh, there's about three and a half million gallons of Cabernet uh, available at that point in time last year. If you want to go from gallons to litres, times it by 3.785. So it's about 13 million litres available July last year. You go to the right hand side, July 2022, there's about 5.3 million gallons. So that's about 20 million litres of Cabernet that we've got sitting there still to move through. So we don't see them purchasing Cabernet from Australia anytime soon. Chardonnay, we reckon they might be looking for bits and pieces later in the year, but we will have to wait and see how their vintage plays out. Staying in the Americas, Argentina has been having a bit of a rough trot. Um, they're heavily impacted with their economy with inflation and high interest rates. Uh, their 22 crush was down a little bit just off the back of having a touch of frost late last year. Um, the domestic scene caused quite a stir where everyone rushed through to pick up some extra grapes and wine just to cover them for that. But that hasn't really panned out on the export side um, to flow through. So their export sales are down 19%. Bulk sales for that is down 40%, bottled sales down nearly 6%. So they're struggling quite a bit there. Their pricing is quite high. Um, you know, two years ago, they used to have dry red and dry white priced at around 25 US cents ex winery. Uh, you need to add about 10 cents to get to FOB, but they were very, very competitive. And with inflation and interest rates and everything going on over there, they're just no longer really a competitive market anymore. China sort of turned off the tap to them because they, they won't look at the pricing. Plus you have to pay import duty because there's no free trade agreement on that side. And so now they've got a lot of carryover stock to move through and it's just taking quite some time to sort of track through all those bits and pieces. Malbec is still the strong one over there. It's probably the, the, the key varietal that's moving through. Um, there's good availability and there's, there's solid demand for it as well. Keeping with their neighbour Chile, they're quite similar to Australia in their sort of situation. We tend to go in, in cycles with how they um, move and flow through the years. 
Um, their 22 crash figure is probably going to be down about 10%. They've um, had a lot of issues with drought as well, essentially a decade long drought. So they're always looking for more rainfall. Um, reds have been quiet. They move bits and pieces, but it's in small batches. But whites are again in high demand. Savvy Blanc, Chardonnay, Dry White and other bits and pieces are definitely moving well. Um, they do have a lot of Pinot Noir, but it seems to be a quiet market for them over on that side. Um, and more issues with um, shortage of dry goods, inflation, price of fuel increasing. They've also got issues with labour shortage. Um, the copper mines are providing higher wages for employees. So they're sealing a lot of their um, pruners and pickers coming across to those different industries just to get um, more money per hour. Um, the Chinese market is still quite live over there, but I think it's um, heading into that next level where they're now looking at buying wineries and vineyards or more so than they have in the past. And I think that's just a reflection that Australia is no longer on the cards for them. So they're definitely looking at other countries to you know, put their money into. Other crops are getting bigger and bigger, um, cherries, walnuts, avocados, and we're seeing them take uh, the water supply that, you know, is normally available for the wineries. It's definitely you know, vying for that sort of demand for it as well. Heading over to the UK, they're still our biggest uh, buyer by volume and by value. Um, we saw the removal of the VI1 certificates, which is great, uh, saved us a little bit of time and effort. We've got the free trade agreement coming into effect, which is uh, gonna uh, make our lives a little bit easier. But there is some concern about the tax reform that's supposed to come into effect later this year. Uh, that's going to change the way they tax uh, material. So it will be on the alcohol percentage, no longer on the product. So we will see that push up the pricing of a bottle of wine. So if it was a five pound bottle, they now expect it to be about five, five pounds and 40 pence. Um, post lockdowns, we definitely saw a decrease in the off trade. Um, we did see a lot of those consumers drinking a little bit more uh, premium uh, during this period. So they're willing to spend a few more pennies per bottle during the lockdown. And we're seeing that flow through uh, post lockdown as well. So we're hoping that that continues to maintain this. On the on trade, 41% increase, lots of people drinking sparkling and champagne. So they're definitely out and happy to celebrate. Having a quick look at this uh, graph here, I've got on the left hand side, you can see the price of a bottle of wine in uh, British pounds, um, obviously at the lower end, whereas a lot of the stock of um, bulk material goes to, you can see just how much goes into VAT and excise duty. Um, as you sort of move up the price point and you get towards the 10 pound and 20 pound bottles, you can see just how much money you've got for wine and for the, the total mileage and for the retailer at the other end. On the right hand side, we've got the top five importing countries into the UK. Um, obviously a lot of sort of local stuff there out of Europe, France, Italy, and Spain, but Australia, New Zealand, we're pushing in there quite heavy. Um, we seem to be increasing our numbers year on year. So hopefully we can keep uh, pushing that as our, our main buyer. Uh, and have a quick look at the little table down the bottom there, top 10 favorite wine varieties into the UK. Note one, two, and three are all whites. Um, note that there is no Shiraz on that list either. Uh, staying within Europe, over to the Frenchies. Um, their 2021 crop was heavily affected by frost. Um, we didn't see a lot of buying activity out of Australia off the back of that. They tend to stick domestically or buy material out of Spain. Coming into this crop, um, there has been a little bit of frost. There's been some hail in the Bordeaux area of Gironde. Uh, and also in Cognac, and they've also got some bushfires in the local Garonde area. So we're waiting to see how that pans out with a bit of smoke taint. Um, white wines are mostly unavailable. Uh, Rosé is close to sold out, but there are plenty of reds available. This seems to be that uh, consumer shift that we're seeing where most people are, are looking to just consume whites at this point in time. Um, prices remain pretty stable, but they are higher. Um, we haven't seen a lot of business move through into China for France. Uh, I think that's just been off the back of the lockdown. We couldn't get samples there. We couldn't get them signed off. We couldn't get orders completed. So they're hoping to see a bit more traction happening for them soon. Um, same issue with shipping constraints, access to dry goods, uh, getting clear bus bottles has been a, a difficult one for Europe as well. 
Um, and one other thing to note, and I know Tony Battaglin would have touched on this at, at Wine Tech the other week, was the ability for other governments to provide uh, cash flow or funding to the wine industry within their countries. So in 2020, France had a very big crop. Um, so in early to mid 21, the government put in place an emergency distillation plan. Uh, it was basically an, an idea where you could put for your wine, it would get distilled and you would get money in return for it. Um, they had so much uh, interest in it, they had interest in, in, increased it from 200 million litres to 320 million litres. Um, they received pretty good pricing for it as well. It was between 58 and 78 euro cents. And if you have a look over at the table with the pricing, you can see it. it's not too bad from you know uh, how things could be. Moving over to Spain, <clears throat> they had a, a smaller size crush last year, but they are expecting a pretty big crop this year. Um, they've had a fair bit of warm weather. They've had a really hot heat wave in early July, um, but they are kind of similar into our market where they've got plenty of red wine, lots in inventory. Uh, they're probably the second most competitive country out there after us. Um, all their whites are high in demand and are close to sort out. Um, they do quite well with concentrate. A lot of people chase them down for the material, but because of refrigeration costs increasing each time, energy and fuel, that pricing seems to be sneaking up and up as we go. Inflation, 10.2%, highest it's been since 1985. So they've got some issues there with consumers just being concerned about uh, penny pinching again. Um, same sort of a situation happened in Spain as France. They also put in an emergency distillation plan. The government gave them 90 million euros, 30 to 40 euros uh, cents per litre. Uh, you can see there when you compare it with the table of pricing, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's half to two thirds of what the price was. So it's not the, the worst thing in the world. At least they got something out of it. Moving over to Italy, um, they had a very big crush last year. It was bigger than they were expecting. This year, they looks like it'll be down a little bit just because they've got some drought in the northern areas and it's been the hottest June in 30 years. Um, speaking of the drought, we know that their government is giving them around about $35 million for some of the regions in the north, just to help them along with those, those droughts uh, issues and, and lack of water. Um, for their market, the red wine prices are definitely softening, the sales are slowing. The whites still remain quite stable, and that's in particular Prosecco and Pinot Gris. Um, the biggest issue for them is getting those clear glass bottles again. Um, it's just timing. They need to get them in, uh, get their material bottled, get it out and get it on the shelves before the 22 stock comes in in the next month or two. So it's really a timing issue for them. Uh, the other thing to note is Italy is one of the biggest suppliers to Russia for wine. So they've now got 115 million litres of wine that they need to find a different home for, which just adds back into the pool of uh, all the other bulk wine that we have out there available. Um, logistical issues remain a problem for them, as does inflation, highest for them in the last 23 years. So again, that ongoing theme keeps happening uh, around the world. Moving over to South Africa, this will be my last slide for the countries. Uh, their crush is down around about 5%. They've had a pretty good year. It's gonna be good quality. Um, their bulk pricing remains quite stable and they've got uh, strong domestic consumption. They were on again and off again during the COVID lockdowns as their government um, put a prohibition uh, in place for the purchase of alcohol at the local, local bottle lows. Um, and it's finally, you know, back on again now. So there seems to be some strong demand and things are moving through well. White varieties are always strong for them. Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, even a little bit of Chenin Blanc. Um, reds are moving here and there. They have a really good international shipping route to Europe. It seems to be working quite well for them. It's mostly Shiraz and Merlot. Cabernet and Rosé do seem to be a bit quieter, but they do have a lot of dry white left over. I think that's simply the fact that a lot of people tend to purchase Chenin Blanc or Sauvignon Blanc instead um, for the difference in price. They can get something you know, that's a little more floral, a little bit more suited to their needs. So they're happy to go down that path instead. Uh, looking at this table, uh, this is all based in USD. 
Uh, it gives you an overall view of some of the top six varieties that we've seen out there in the market. Um, have a look at where Australia is placed in red. Um, we're the number one in the globe for pricing on red wines, Shiraz, Cab, Merlot and Dry Red. Dry White and Chardonnay, we're not doing too bad. Um, you can see Spain there nipping on our heels. They're the next ones down in regards to competitiveness. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll show you this next slide, which will be July 2020, which will show you where we were at two years ago. You can see Australia's pretty close to the bottom on most of the reds. Dry white and Chardonnay were around about the same place. Spain, give or take, you know, they're kind of there in the middle. Argentina would be the one to know. They're top of the list for six of all of those wines there. So this was back when they were selling dry red and dry white at 25 cents ex winery. Um, very effective, very cost competitive. Um, and nowadays, you know, that market's completely flipped for them. So I think it'll only be a matter of time before they come back and have more competitive material available for us. So just to summarize, uh, red wine, we know we've got a lot. Um, we know we need to move through it. Um, it's excellent quality, especially out of 21. We've got some really great pricing. We just need to be able to get some more of that freight available so we can move through it quicker. Um, we are seeing that consumer shift towards white wines. Um, definitely a lot of people chasing Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay. Um, the reds, on the other hand, you know, just because everyone's got something available at this point in time, they just don't need to go out there and purchase it. Um, I think we will have to look at you know, mothballing red vineyards as we go ahead um, and whether we can get something from the government to subsidise us, we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. International shipping, that's going to continue to be delayed until 2023, if not 2024. Um, supply chain issues around dry goods will probably continue. Again, that's just availability of glass and cardboard and other bits and pieces. Inflation, I mean, that seems to be the buzzword for the last couple of months. It's just uh, really uh, knocking people around about their consumer spending, um, where things are going to be at. It's, it's really going to have an effect on a lot of economies going ahead. Um, I guess looking ahead, you know, we definitely expect there to be some softening of great prices in 2023. Um, we definitely think we need to see a reduced crush size. We just can't accommodate that amount of material coming into tanks. Um, and we just we have limited tank space as it is already. There's just not enough uh, available right at this point in time to be able to bring in um, you know another 1.5, 1.7 million ton crush. So it's definitely challenging times again. Um, I think you know if it means mothballing some vineyards and then looking at selling some temporary water to nut growers, maybe that's something we're going to have to have a look at as well. So that's it from me. My details are there on the screen. If you wanted to reach out and touch base, um, I should also mention that Seattle puts out a global report every month. Uh, so if you're interested in getting some news on that, um, please feel free to uh, touch base with us and we can certainly share some information with you. That's great. Thanks, Simone. Um, just like to remind everyone if they've got a question now, um, they can send it through to the Q&A uh, session on the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. There has been two questions come through, Simone. So I'll just, I'll read them. I'll read the first one out to you. Uh, are you recommending a government funded vine pool scheme based on what data? How many vines should be pulled? Should it be certain varieties or regions at what cost to government or to the sector? Just want to flesh out your policy position. Sorry, that was quite a few questions in the one question. No, no, no. Um, I don't think we're ready for vine pool just yet. I think mothballing would probably be the easier way to accommodate things for the short term. How long we're going to be in this situation is, you know, the $64,000 question. Uh, I think it's going to be at least another one to two years that we're going to see some really challenging times going ahead. Um, we really need more ability to ship the wine out uh, with freight um, rather than probably pulling the vineyards up right now. Um, so I think that's probably the last resort at this point in time, um, but it's definitely something I think we're going to possibly have to look at longer term later on in you know three to five years. Okay, um, there's one other question that's just come through and it might be referring to maybe a couple of your last slides. It's, what do you mean when you say we are not doing too bad on pricing comparison? 
is a lower price better? It definitely uh, attracts the buyers. Um, you know, if you're a retailer, you're a supermarket and you're looking for something that's cost effective, you're going to go for best quality and best price. And right now, Australia's definitely got that on the red market. Um, the issue is, yeah, again, with the freight and the cost of freight. If they compared Australia with Spain and you're buying out of Europe, um, then you, you know that, uh, you know, getting freight uh, from Spain across to, say, the UK is going to be simple, easy and quick. Whereas getting it out of Australia, it's going to be six weeks for a container, it's going to be 12 weeks on the water, and it's going to be twice the price in freight to get it over there. So while we are very uh, cost effective with price, um, we are very good with quality as well. So we are you know, definitely appealing to buyers, but we just have to add up all the sums around everything else for, as well, which is where that freight component comes into work. Okay. Um, there hasn't been any other questions uh, sent through at this point in time. So um, I think as Simone mentioned before, if anyone has any further questions, then um, they're able to probably contact Simone directly uh, via um, her email address or, or look up her company and find her that way, um, or alternatively come through the Adabri and we can put you in touch with Simone. So thanks again, Simone, for uh, providing the important insights into the current global conditions. I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of this session. I'd also like to thank the audience uh, for joining in today and taking part. And I'd like to remind you, as always, that this video um, recording of this webinar will be available on the Adabrise YouTube channel uh, within 24 hours. Just also like to acknowledge that Wine Australia uh, for, for providing funding for um, this program um, and support by the webinar program of the Adabrise Extension Project. The next webinar, oops. The next webinar, apologies, is on Thursday, uh, next Thursday, July the 28th, and it's titled Overview of the 2022 National Vintage Report. If you'd like to register for this session, please visit the Atterbury website under the events tab. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all at our next Atterbury webinar. Thanks again. Have a good day. Thanks, Matt.